Very few companies in the industry can really lay claim to saying they genuinely changed the industry. But Audemars Piguet has managed to do it not once, but also twice. Hi everyone and welcome to Shaluso and welcome to a new segment called the Icons. On this particular segment, I'm going to be talking about iconic watches from key brands, talking about essentially what makes them iconic as well as their history and what innovations or new things they brought to the industry that had a seismic shift on both the brands that make them as well as the industry itself. And it'd be great after this video if you guys could put in the comments what your suggestions would be for other iconic watches that I should cover in this segment. But in the meantime, let's get started and today's icon is the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Offshore. Now for those of you who subscribe and follow the channel, you know by now I always like to start out with a little bit of history. So in the case of the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Offshore, its story doesn't actually start in 1993 when it was actually released to the public. No, it actually starts back as far as 1989 when it was originally conceived. And the design brief that was given to the uh, designers, specifically Emmanuel Guet, who ended up being the designer for the Royal Oak Offshore, was that they had to make something that was able to appeal to a younger audience. As early as 1989, Audemars Piguet already realized that after the boom of the 80s, the new money that had been entering the market, that were all buying two-tone Rolexes and Daydates, AP realized that they were missing out on this market. And also something that embodied, at that time at least, their notions of masculinity. So the notion that it had to be big, it had to be chunky, it had to be thick, something that was clearly a man's watch. And then in 1992, we saw the announcement and eventual release in 1993 of the Royal Oak Offshore. And of course, when it was released, much in the same way that just over 20 years before, the original Royal Oak was met with a lot of skepticism and even a little bit of confusion, the 42mm wide, 16mm high Royal Oak Offshore shocked the industry. The original designer of the Royal Oak himself, Gerald Genta, really didn't like it. He thought it was terrible. But in the same way that at first people didn't really get the Royal Oak, very quickly within the first year orders started flooding in and it was a sweeping success. And for a little bit of perspective in this, in 1993 Panerai had just started to release watches to civilians. They wouldn't get their boost in publicity from Sylvester Stallone until 1996 in the movie Daylight. On top of that, Patek Philippe's Aquanaut, which was their response to the younger market, that didn't come out until 1997 before five years after the offshore was announced and four years after was actually released. So again, Patek was late to the party on the innovation front. And that's before we even talk about the fact that at this time, Hublot was still putting rubber straps on gold cases with quartz movements in them. They were a long, long way away from releasing the Big Bang in 2005. Now in terms of innovations, well, mechanically, the Royal Oak Offshore has never exactly been particularly innovative. When it was first released, it had a JLC movement that carried on until 2007 when they replaced the base movement with an Audemars Piguet in-house movement. However, through its entire history from 1993 up until 2021, it has always been a modular chronograph. It was only in 2021 that they pulled in the movement originally released in the Code 1159 that now the Royal Oak Offshore has a fully integrated column wheel chronograph as part of its regular production. So mechanically, it's never really been particularly groundbreaking, obviously always very nicely decorated, but nothing particularly new or industry changing. But where the offshore really did pioneer things was in terms of materials. On a technical front, Audemars Piguet and the Royal Oak Offshore specifically were miles ahead of their comparators in Patek Philippe and Bacheron Constantin. Rubber straps, okay, you know, not that impressive. Other companies had made them and Patek even followed suit pretty quickly in 1997 with the Aquanaut. But what about ceramics? Forged carbon, titanium, half a kilo of platinum on your wrist if you get the platinum offshore. While Audemars Piguet was by no means the first to use most of these, they were the first within that ultra high-end segment. They were breaking down the barriers in the same way that in 1972, the notion of a steel sports watch sold by a company like Audemars Piguet or Patek Philippe was completely unheard of. So Audemars Piguet was experimenting with new materials just as they did in the 70s. They did it, but on overdrive in the 90s and the early 2000s. So the Royal Oak Offshore, both from a material standpoint as well as a size standpoint, 
has literally been the royal oak, but on steroids, doing everything that little bit more. And what more would you expect from a watch that was conceived at the end of a decade and era like the 1980s? So their innovation definitely wasn't in mechanics, but it also pushed beyond just the physical and in materials. Because also where the Royal Oak Offshore innovated was in its marketing. Partnerships with actors like Arnold Schwarzenegger and even placements in specific limited editions in movies like End of Days or Terminator 3. Its partnerships with Michael Schumacher and Juan Pablo Montoya, they were making Formula One themed watches while Richard Mille was still struggling to get people to even pronounce his name right. This combined with the fact that they were the first of the big three to really properly target a younger and a broader audience shows that again the offshore really does change the way that people look at watches because when one of the big three does something then the others tend to follow so that blueprint that the offshore set out it influenced the rest of the industry in a major way beyond just making big watches trendy and that brings us on to really what makes this an icon first and foremost obviously its influence on the big watch trend is huge while definitely other companies had made big watches before the navitimer the speedmaster those were considered bigger watches However, those were big with a purpose. They were tool watches. They were big because they had to be legible. This was a watch that was big for style's sake. It was big for the sake of establishing a new segment in the industry. And while all other things being equal, brands like Panerai may have still existed, they wouldn't have gotten that same level of acceptance without that validation from the top that big watches were something that was relevant and important within the luxury industry. And that was coming from a brand like Audemars Piguet. So a brand like Panerai, models like the Omega Planet Ocean, the Rolex Skydweller, the Yachtmaster 2, which was released in the midst of the big watch trend. Hublot as a brand, which is defined by its larger watch, released in 2005. Jacob Co., the 2002 IWC Big Pilot. None of these would have really had the same level of success had Audemars Piguet not set that standard that it was okay to do this. Not just okay, but also fashionable and the right thing to do in the same way that they did in 1972 when they released the original Royal Oak. So for those reasons, the way that it's shaped Audemars Piguet's marketing philosophy as well as its material experimentation, while the Royal Oak may have saved Audemars Piguet as a brand, definitely the offshore is what allowed it to grow as a brand. And as well as its impact on the industry in terms of establishing that yes, high horology brands have to market to younger audiences. That yes, big watches can combine with high quality finishing, with well decorated movements, with serious watches from serious brands, they can still do that. For those reasons, it's influence on the brand as well as the industry. The Royal Oak Offshore is an icon. So I hope you like this new segment. Let me know in the comments below what other iconic watches you'd like to see featured on the channel. Let me know what your thoughts are on the Royal Oak Offshore and its impact on Audemars Piguet as well as its impact on the watch industry in general. I'd love to know your thoughts and opinions in the comments below. A big thanks to Zager Watches in Sydney, Australia for lending in the watch that was used for the original footage featured throughout this video. And of course, if you like this video, make sure you like it and share it. If you want to see more pictures and infographics of watches, make sure you follow me on Instagram at Shaluso. If you want to see more videos of watches, make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell as well so you know when the next video comes out. In any case, thanks for watching this video and we'll catch you on the next one.